Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn sort of explained why the why the, the title here. Uh, of course, until the Chat GPT explosion, uh, the uh, my main problem with artificial intelligence is that literary translators will become obsolete because all this will be done by uh, 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 by machine translation systems, and it only takes one publisher to think it's a good idea. Then, so uh, so in a way, this. This talk is already quaintly obsolete because we have bigger problems than, than that. So uh, I'm doing. I'm sort of hoping that the audience is sort of at least has been touched by the stylometric mafia somehow in their lives. So uh, I won't be showing how the Burroughs Delta is is done, and uh, we, you have to. I mean, if you don't believe in that, you have to believe it for the next 20 minutes that. Uh, authors are uh, make their text characteristic by their frequent words, and and the the uh, the uh, workflow that I'll be using is described by Edder in 2017, counting very frequent words, comparing their frequencies in 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 text to each by each, uh, uh, putting uh, together a cluster analysis, and then converting that into a network analysis, so you get pretty pictures. Everybody got that? Yeah, okay. So, uh, the translator as a living being is, in fact, quite, an early, quite a late concept in translation studies. Uh, and, uh, but, of course, you have to ask yourself that if you're, if you're dealing with stylometry, which counts most frequent words, well, you have to stop and wonder for a while, so who picks the words in the translation? Uh, is that somehow also a sign of the authorial signal? Is, is, is it just the language? Or is the translator responsible for that, as all reviewers seem to be thinking when they complain? Uh, and, uh, and, and so, of course, translating then into stylometry, you see what I did here, translating. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, we don't really know. Uh, so, uh, actually, that's a horrible idea. Uh, so, um, that is uh, the, the first sign that translation studies started looking at the, at the translator for signs of individual life, I should say. But, of course, uh, don't be fooled by Lawrence Venuti. That's ironic. This is when he says, no, uh, the invisible translator is a myth. Sadly, in stylometry, unless something weird happens, texts translated into other languages tend to cluster by original author. If somebody could please explain this to me in the discussion, it would really make my life. Uh, so uh, let's now look what happens when you do machine translation of literary texts. So, in those blissful times when we made fun of Google Translate as a possible competitor, we literary translators, I put uh, a number of texts by the Polish Nobel Prize winner of 1905, whom we've all read, Henryk Sienkiewicz, and uh, you could see that his books translated by humans stuck by the book, by the original book, except for Google Translate, who uh, who basically you could barely read. This is a love story set among the early Christians. Uh, so uh, actually, and, and and other books stuck to, uh, to to that one as well. So so that was fine. We felt safe. So, but now of course, machine translation went uh, neural network and deep learning. And so it was time to make a slightly more serious experiment. I'm only presenting results for English and French. Uh, Polish was also part of it, but we don't have time for that. So here's the experiment. I took 50 classic French novels by nine authors. You can see them here. Uh, and in our network analysis, they all cluster very nicely. I mean, the Balzac is Balzac, Dumas. Proust. These are the originals, of course. So that's what that's what was to be expected. Authorship attribution works. Uh, but then, of course, again, 
when we translate that using a lot of human uh, translators into, uh, into uh, English from French, well, the, the view doesn't change much. I mean, there's, again, there's still a go is a go, and Proust is Proust, and Dumas is Dumas, with a, just a, a tad of Anatole France, and Zola and Flaubert are, are sort of just a little mixed up, but they sometimes mix up in the original as well. So uh, uh, you see, nothing is happening here. And Verne, of course, is Verne. He's sort of an outsider here, isn't he? So, so then, uh, that was at a time when DPL and Google Translate were allowing you a certain amount of megabytes to be translated. So I used up all of our family emails to do it for free. Should I be saying things like that? I'm from Poland, I can say anything. And, and so, and so uh, to this, I added two machine translations of each book. And that is the scary result that I got. You see the colors sticking together? The machine translations are just right there with, uh, uh, with the human translations. And uh, also, they, they sort of tend to stick by the book, which is sort of understandable. But, but you can't even, even within those, those Dumases, you can't really see uh, any, any sub-communities of, uh, of human and, and, and machine. So that's, that's scary. Uh, and Verne behaves in the same way. And uh, Flaubert and Zola, now nicely divided. If you think that's a separate community, still it's it's uh, it's there's still humans and and machine mix and machine translations uh, stuck together. And except for one, Proust. So I mean, the yellow is is sort of still forms sort of a uh, 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 still forms a sort of a community. But these are all machine translations, and these stop that. And these are uh, human translations. So this is sort of a, a glimpse of ho a little flick of hope. Of course, the fact that we that the Moncrief translations are all here. Moncrief was such an eminent writer and translator that Evelyn Woe served as his personal secretary. Can you imagine having Evelyn Woe for secretary? Anyway, so, and, and the Hudson translation of uh, Temps Retrouvé is, is in between, but, it's, but at least here we get the division. So, it seems that if we apply stylome stylometric authorship attribution as we use it now to uh, machine translations, <clears throat> And human translations, we can't really tell the difference. The translators are invisible. Lawrence Venuti was very cross when he saw my previous results on that, by the way. Do you know we look almost exactly the same, except he has the beard? Uh, and and, and there, is, there is what, uh, what we have, except for uh, perhaps for Proust. The question is, of course, why Proust? You know why Proust. Um, that's why. <laughs> I know this is his longest sentence. But still, also, uh, I'm pretty happy it's, it's, I had to use such a small font because it's really anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, so, so that's Proust. And because now, when you look at simple things like Dumas in the original, remember how D'Artagnan is supposed to be dueling Portus and Athos and Aramis, not necessarily in that, when, when, just when they meet? Uh, well, this is a human translation. And, uh, uh, and this is a machine translation. 
I've read worse from humans. And I don't mean my students in my literary translation class, but humans. Uh, hello, Joanna. <laughs> and uh, uh, anybody saw the difference? I know it's unfair, you're just sitting here. And, uh, well, one thing I see is uh, machine translations don't exoticize. It's always very tempting for translations of French stuff into English to do monsieur, but that doesn't occur to, to our friend the machine translation yet until we tell them. But you won't, right? And uh, now with Proust, and of course I had to do the, the Madeleine bit. I mean, come on. But even in the Madeleine bit, this is the Moncrief translation, short, plump little cakes. Isn't that sweet? Uh, now, with machine translation, <laughs> things started to go horribly wrong. There's wrong pronouns, there's lost, uh, uh, lost track of the sentence, and, and, and then this. So in machine translation of Proust, at least in 2000, uh, okay, that was in 2022, uh, instead of this, we're getting this. <laughs> you know, it's quite easy to find a picture of a badly made Madeleine on the internet, really, one minute. So, ah, how much time do I have? Yeah, excellent. So this, is, this you're getting for free. This wasn't in the abstract, because I thought, come on, Yana, just to end this on such a note. So, so how do we tackle the machine translation fooling stylometry? And if you want to, there's, I mean, there's plenty of things we could do. One thing that occurred to me as a former human translator is that we love doing this and this. Sometimes I think out of the pure desire to be like real writers and make a decision about a text, you know, and then we say, it doesn't sound well in Polish, like that meant anything. And so, uh, and actually, that's something Antoine Bermond tells us never to do, but he's dead, so we don't care anymore. And uh, so it was interesting to check. Now, of course, uh, first idea is like, you know, average sentence length, that wouldn't work, because I know exactly that it's not that some translators just combine sentences and some translators uh, 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 cut sentences into pieces. Very often the same translator in the same book will be doing this. So, uh, of course, that is a good hypothesis. Uh, and, uh, and so, perhaps something like that should work. So, so we might want to treat... Uh, uh, the sentence lengths, sentence one, sentence two, sentence three, etc., in the text as sort of a time series, or like, and and apply. I can't believe I'm using such a. <sighs> and and my meteorologist friend uses that to look for rainfall patterns, and people study different people walking that, and in this case. Uh, I tried looking at sequence of sentence lengths, and the nice thing is that this dynamic time warping distance translates immediately into something I can do, which is cluster analysis. And so now there's a couple of examples, and again, the hypothesis is the original should be surrounded by two machine translations, and uh, the human translation should come last. So this is good, this is good, this is good, and I've done something wrong. There you go, and this is okay, and that's wrong, but that's Proust. So we figured out Proust in the so, and uh, and that's wrong, and that's good. So uh, when you count the stuff, you get eighty-one percent right, but then. Uh, Six out of nine errors are Proust, whom we identified at the first run. So, you know, it's a simple enough thing to do. So, uh, 
So, you see I'm addressing a, a valid social problem here. Think of the people who might be destitute. Because if, if that... So, uh, so uh, all this leads us to the fact that uh, our human, I don't know, flamboyance, fallibility, is uh, how we stay different from artificial intelligence, because they, this, it translates in too much of a rational way. Yeah, there you go. I'm done.